Welcome to LBB's Open House, our podcast on how to build brands better. I'm Suchita, the co-founder of LBB and I'm your host as well. On Open House, I have candid conversations with founders, CXOs, investors behind India's most compelling brands and businesses. Today, I'm in conversation with William Bissell, who's the chairman of Fab India. Fab India needs no introduction. It's one of India's largest and leading lifestyle brands with over 200 stores across India. In fact, they recently celebrated their 60th anniversary, which is phenomenal. In this episode, William and I talk about how to think long term and differentiate static from signal while building your brand. He gives this really interesting statistic around how the life ex- expectancy of corporates is declining. Um, and we dive into what it takes to build brands that can outlast trends. Fab India has evolved a lot over the past couple of years with Fab Cafe, their experience centers and more. And given the impact that COVID's had on retail, William shares his point of view on what the future of retail is and where lifestyle brands should be investing to reap long-term gains. I've spoken to William a bunch of times in the past. His humility and honesty is honestly super inspiring and you'll hear exactly what I'm referring to over here in this episode. I learned a lot from this conversation and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, So first off, thank you so much for doing this. Um, I've had the pleasure of interacting with you a couple of times in the past and I've always learned so much from every single interaction that we've had and I'm excited for our listeners, uh, you know, many of whom are entrepreneurs actually to also get a chance at uh, learning from you um, uh, and also, you know, thinking through how they can build their brand better. I'm going to start with with what I hope is the most uh, meta question out of, you know, what I have planned today. Uh, which is Fab India, just, uh, you guys just celebrated your 60th anniversary. Congratulations on that. Um, in an age that's so obsessed with, you know, instant gratification, IPOing in like 15 years at, you know, crazy high valuations as we saw with Airbnb and DoorDash, how have you guys built a long-term mindset? So, uh, you know, you as a, as a chairman, as a, um, uh, you know, as, as someone who, who was at the range of Fab India, how have you built a long-term mindset, uh, both personally as well as organizationally? So, Suchita, you, you're right. You know, uh, when Fab India was created in 1960, the average good company lasted 50 years. Today, the average good company lasts 20 years. I mean, this is a sad fact of life, but that's the life expectancy shrunk, you know. So while human life expectancy is increased, corporate life expectancy is actually shrunk. And, and so it's an important question. And it's one that I think about a lot because at, at 60, we should be, you know, in, you know, at, at the end of our lives. But, you know, I, I feel that the way you, you stay relevant is, is important um, in, in terms of how entrepreneurs and, and people who are setting up businesses and running businesses think about you know, their legacy and their future. And and that should be done from day one. It's not something you do when you're 20 years old or 15 years old. It should be done from day one. And I think it it it, it revolves around um, understanding what it is to have a long-term mindset. So uh, a long-term mindset is one where you, uh, even the day you start the company, you have a long-term mindset. Um, and it it's important to sort of filter out the static, you know, from the signal, you know, as, as that famous Daniel Kahneman quote is, you know, you have to filter the static and the signal because the static is what, you know, oh my God, Airbnb, look at it. It's amazing. It's amazing. And everybody was this morning, like five people sent me the CEO's interview where he was at loss for words because his price, you know, went up. So that to me is a lot of static, that euphoria, the unicorn story, like, um, and you, you then focus, you know, once you're able to filter that out, you're able to say, okay, what am I doing in the long term that's really going to make a difference, a difference to people's lives, through a service or through something I do. Uh, and that is, the, that is really the, the signal. That is the long-term mindset. And that's how the business is built. Now, you know, if you are able to develop that, then there's momentarily ups and downs, the COVID crashes, the the unicorn pops, the, these things, you're, you're able to take them in your stride. If you're not able to do that, then you tend to be, you, know, you, you tend to really lose sight of what the business is about. And eventually the business loses itself. Um, and, um, and you have to, to do that, you have to ask some very fundamental questions. So, so when the COVID began, I said, you know, we're going to have to put everything aside and concentrate on three things. First, we have to survive then we have to revive, and then we have to thrive. 
So for survival, we cut everything we could because I didn't know how long COVID was going to continue, how long the lockdown would continue, whatever. So we survived and we came out of the survival phase in, in quite good shape. Uh, and I mean that because I had said, I had thought that we would probably need uh, a debt at the end of the survival phase I had calculated would be around 500 crores. And we ended up using only 220 crores. Um, and so for me, that was an indication of how quickly we were able to come out of the survival phase. We went into the COVID with practically very, very little, tiny amount of debt. So basically, um, that was the key focus in the survival phase. Then in the revival phase, it was how do you, you know, what parts of the business are damaged and how do you fix those and heal those parts? And for us, the biggest problem was our supply chain got really badly affected because the thousands and thousands of micro enterprises at the bottom of our supply chain were really hit bad. So our first thing was how do we help them revive and them signal to us, they, they, their signal to us was very strong. Give us money and give us orders. But first money and second orders. So we then quickly tried to bring our payment cycle down to within 30 days. So the idea was without letting our cash flow go out of control, we brought our payment within 30 days and started uh, placing new orders. So that was part of what I would call the revival phase. And now we have to think about how do you thrive in in this new world that's emerging, you know, there's been some paradigm shifts that have taken place. Retail, old fashioned retail will never be the same, even if COVID was to disappear tomorrow completely. It's not gonna to disappear tomorrow, but hopefully in a year's time, it will be a memory. And when that happens, most people feel that things will go back to normal, which is the old way. I think there is a shift and, and that's important uh, as for business leaders to recognize that shift. And, um, so for you, right, when you sort of see the transition that, you know, Fab India has made over the past 60 years, what have been those, what have been those key milestones, uh, you know, which were inflection points for you, uh, you know, in just building legacy and longevity into your business? So, you know, I, um, we all, I'm a great believer in having people you follow. So one of the businesses I follow is Amul. Because I really feel that, that has been an amazing company. From day one, it was doing in the milk business. Then they introduced simple milk chocolates. Then they introduced simple cheeses. And today they have the most amazing range of chocolates, uh, sugar-free chocolates. They do all kinds of traditional drinks, you know, their charge and their whatever. It's really the best. And so you know, to me, it's a company that constantly has reinvented itself, added fabulous product, you know, and, and to me, you follow people like that as an inspiration because they really, they really teach you, um, you know, about how to understand your consumer and, and meet their evolving needs all the time. And that's, that's a ball you should never lose sight of. Because the day you lose out of that ball, you're actually on the curve to extinction. Correct. The path to extinction. Got it. But like milestones for you. So, you know, were there specific, were there specific points, you know, in your journey where you hit a point in and, you know, and for you, it was a moment of, okay, great. Now it's only onwards and upwards from here. Right. Uh, uh, so uh, just uh, through an example, your way, but uh, what you did with Fab Cafe and your experience centers. Uh, did you, you know, see some amount of inflection come from there? Um, uh, uh, I also uh, read up and, and you work with a lot of local artisan and craftsman communities. Uh, you know, have there been programs that you've put into place uh, that have also helped you sort of, you know, galvanize the way you think about your company and the way you think about, about your growth? So in the past two, three decades, uh, any particular moments that have, you know, happened where, where it's just helped you, you know, create that jolt of momentum within uh, and help you guys, you know, compound your growth even faster. So I think it's it's about having sort of your gaze must fall in three places: the the long term, the medium term, and the short term. And I think that um, in the long term, our vision has been very clear that you know we were and we started life as an export business. We then became a retail business. And now we are going to become an experiential lifestyle brand. 
And that's where the Tugbug and Fab Cafe and the wellness centers and all that comes in because it's all a part of it. That's why our home lines have expanded, become more experiential, more lifestyle. So, and we are also be, going to become a fantastic value-driven online community. So if you, if you were to say, what are your two big long-term ideas? So one of them is that we're going to become a value-driven community, online community. What does that mean? So a value-driven online community means a community that actually stands for something. So you can be, the online environment is divided into two areas, which is very broadly, one is transactional. So a transactional is a marketplace. You go, you, you want to buy an umbrella, you buy an umbrella, you get the best rate, you run a web crawler, you see which site offers you, you know, you want to buy a watch or whatever that's done. That's just purely transactional. The other part of the, the web, which is really interesting, is it's building communities, building virtual communities on the web. And, you know, user-generated content, influencer-generated content, it's all part of the communities. It's It's going back to... You know, we humans are really uniquely wired to be in tribes. You know, we, we started our existence as homo sapiens in tribes. And, you know, so like when I read some of these influencer gener- these influencers who have such loyal followings, they have a tribe. They might have a tribe of 50 followers, 500 followers. So when I say, you know, um, an online, a value-based online community, it's a community built around a shared value system. So if you don't, believe in the value system, don't be a part of our community. You can be do something else. But if you do believe in our value system, what we're trying to do as a brand and what are the values we're trying to promote, then join our community. And we are a community. And you know, this this idea of course came to me from several people. You know, one of them was the one one of them were the founders of Organic India who really uh, understood this. They saw this a long time ago. But the idea that you have a shared values community is a very powerful theme. It's been in it's been in humanity since the beginning of time, since the beginning of the human experience. So, so I believe that that is our, to use a business word, our key differentiator for the online community. And you know, one of the most amazing is we have an incredible uh, team who are building this, led by Aditya Ghosh. I don't, I don't know if you know Aditya. He started his career as a lawyer and then went on uh, to, you know, um, in an amazing uh, built Indigo into, you know, the airline that it is today, and then spent some time at OYO Rooms, and now he's actually building this a value-based community online, which is fantastic. I mean, I think it's going to be. And in, in Fab India, in the retail business, we're actually moving to a lifestyle business. And, you know, a, a lifestyle experiential business is, is very different from a retail store. So that's really in terms of a long-term focus. You know? So where, and we're positioning ourselves, hopefully, for the needs and desires of tomorrow's consumer. And that process is underway. In the medium term, actually, our challenges to clearly improve our ability on execution because if there is one area where the company has been weak and you know as an entrepreneur i see it's an area that we haven't done justice to is our quality of our execution and there you know when you look at companies there are there are some outstanding examples in india of companies that have done execution you know superbly uh you know on time you know and, and so one learns from those kind of examples and one learns from those examples. And, and, and so that's the medium term focus is to really improve the quality of the execution. Um, and, and the short term, uh, interestingly, the short term focus is to really help build capacities internally with our teams. Because as we move into a new way of doing business, people are going to have to enhance their individual capacities and capabilities. And, and that's really... Um, uh, that requires, you know, behavioral change, you know, a different way to. So these are important uh, things to focus on because if we don't get these right, and we have to get all three things: the short term, the medium term, and the long term. If you don't get these right, then your future is in question. I think what's really inspiring about you as a leader and even Fab India as a brand is that you guys have no qualms in reinventing yourself, right? Um, uh, you have absolutely no hangups in changing your mind and in adapting to, you know, changing times. Uh, how are you able to do this? Because it doesn't come naturally to a lot of us, right? A lot of us are so wedded about, you know, the original problem statement and the original idea. 
uh, what have you done you know internally and externally and 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 more so personally to to have an open mind and and to you know uh, be totally okay with transforming your brand um uh, and 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 also taking the number of transformations that you have over the past couple of years you know i i think i've seen uh, such as so many brands die which were outstanding brands and uh, you know it's like every day i visit the graveyard of brands and i every day i say to myself not yet <laughs> yeah it's really you know i mean this there were some such superb brands in india really really superb that that you know for various reasons died out that should have been here today and and the thought of that keeps you thinking and and you know you see um you know i've seen such superb brands just come and go and and uh, they didn't need to die but they died because people got arrogant they didn't listen um they didn't change everybody dies for the same reasons you know it's unlike human body somebody might die of a heart attack somebody might die of something in businesses you all die because of the same reasons all good businesses if you look at the, if the doctor was to tell you why that person they, they all die of the same reasons and and basically it comes out of not seeing the change not understanding the change not seeing the change you, know, you look at a company like kodak they invented digital film and they dumped it i mean so they they basically invented the future and then they said we're not going to embrace it and they dumped it you look at a company like general electric you look at so many um, great companies i mean amazing companies that today are either gone or are, you know have been diminished so much that and you think to yourself gosh you know arrogance is another thing you know it's really really interesting um where arrogance comes in and and how it just it's like not being able to see any more things that are just right in front of you um and and you see these companies one after the other die and um and the reasons sadly are all the same what are usually the reasons like what what have you seen become a, a trend with these you know flailing companies well so recently i saw a really amazing internet company fail uh and it was the same reasons for a traditional company failing the founder was completely arrogant he never listened to anybody he was a brilliant guy he is a brilliant guy there's no doubt about it he's brilliant but he didn't listen to anybody the other thing is he started talking about subjects he knew nothing about uh so you might not you might know your business very well but tomorrow if i ask you if i should invest in the stock market and you start rattling off things which you know nothing about and you feel that because you know your business you know that as well and um the third thing that is is really interesting is that there was a shift in this person's business and they didn't see it because when you're arrogant and when you're full of yourself and you think you know it all and you've had some early successes you miss it and the consumer thing it it went like this and and you know he was still on, on a path and that path led to a cliff and a couple of people i was one of them and a couple of people said you know this path is going to lead to a cliff oh you are such old this is really the old school approach he said to me this is really the old school approach and he said to me it's a 20th century approach i said death exists in the 19th century the 18th century the 20th century the 21st century it's not going to go away businesses will die no matter which century <laughs> he said that is so last century he drove his car straight off the cliff and his business straight off the cliff and it was sad to see because i think it had potential in, but it's the same the reason why you know you know i was looking at some young people get a car recently uh and it was a a, a new car that's just entered the indian market and they were looking at it, it was an 11 and 12 lakh rupee car and they were all saying to themselves wow this is like i mean they were just ooing and eyeing over it and i know nothing about cars i mean i couldn't i didn't even know that car and i was just watching them and i was like wow and then within a few months this particular brand that nobody had heard of it's a korean car manufacturer that nobody heard of has taken over the market 
has wiped out the wiped the floor clean with the uh, Hondas and has just pushed them into the background. So everybody was going to buy one of those other cars. And I was just looking at these kids and they were not even able to afford that car, but they were probably influencers. They could go back and tell their parents. They were look, and the way they were looking at the car, for me, a car is four wheels in a box, right? I mean, Same. it's not, I mean, you can yeah. do it. The only thing is in summer, I like the air conditioning to work and, you know, I prefer if it gets good mileage. So that's the furthest I will go. But the way they were looking at it was they were in love. They were, it was consumer love. They were, they were in love. Their eyes had like sparkles in them. And, and I was like, wow. And then I started reading about this brand. And I was like, my God, they've just come into India. They've pretty much wiped the market clean. And how come it isn't on the front page of all the newspapers? But, but that's, that's what happens if you're, not, if, you, if you're not paying attention to your consumer. Speaking of paying attention to your consumer, you've seen like two, three decades of consumer habits transform and change, right? Um, like you said, uh, this customer was first, uh, you know, going offline. Um, uh, this customer was buying X type of goods and items. Uh, and obviously, over the past two to three years, the way customers consume and what they consume has transformed um, a hell of a lot. Uh, you guys have over 200 stores in every corner of India. Uh, you've had three generations of customers, everyone from my grandmom to my mom to me, all of us have, you know, grown up shopping at Fab India. Uh, what has actually pleasantly surprised you or delighted you about the Indian customer over the past couple of years? A lot of younger people, and I see this, are driven by um, a higher purpose. I can see this a lot of young Young people are driven by a higher purpose and they're willing to make sacrifices in their lives, uh, monetary sacrifices. And I think that's an amazing thing about this generation. I think that they are willing to sell to their parents and look, I'm going to take a job that pays me half the salary because it's doing something that I think is important. Uh, I see this everywhere. I see it in development. I see it in people working in rural areas. I see it in people working in, you know, in, in, in so many areas. And they walk away from, from, you know, big fat paychecks. And, um, you know, it's, and, you know, I don't know if you saw that Ikigai diagram, which was very popular a few years ago on, you know, purpose and passion and what you're good at and what pays you money. It's a series of intersecting circles. Um, And, you know, what was interesting about that is that a lot of the young today are actually they want to live that value system. And I think that's, I think that's terrific. And they have the choices. They know, like somebody I was telling them, why are you walking away from such a job? And uh, he's 21. And he said, look, I know I can get that job. He says, I know I can get that job. He said, I know I have the skills, but I want to do something more meaningful with my life. And I thought that was fantastic. So, so meaningful is, uh, I mean, uh, and you've totally hit the nail on the head, right? Because now there are also so many more causes that one can align themselves with, right? Sustainability being one a fairly relevant cause specifically within, you know, lifestyle as a category. Um, uh, anything in terms of, you know, trends or even abilities to spend that has actually pleasantly surprised you? Uh, because Fab India as a brand is definitely not cheap, right? Uh, I would assume you classify yourself more as a mass stage brand where uh, the prices are competitive enough, but not, uh, uh, but not, you know, perhaps one where you make impulse purchases. Um, how have you, uh, what is the relationship in between money and customers that you've seen change? Um, and just to, you know, uh, 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 give you an example, I remember my, my grandmother used to go to Fab India for occasion buys, right? So for your like festival, she would go to Fab India and buy a sari and I've seen myself and now, you know, everything from uh, the mugs that I use in my kitchen to home decor, uh, more of your everyday buys have started coming from Fab India. Uh, so how have you seen this customer and their relationship with money, objects and things uh, change over the past, uh, you know, couple of decades? So the three changes that have, uh, in a way, surprised me and really caught me off guard. Uh, and I think that they happen much faster than I thought they would happen. Uh, and we we are we are actually behind the curve as a business. So the customer has evolved, and we're racing to catch up with that customer. So in in a, in a way, it's it's a weakness that that we we took too long. So there are three, as I see it, mega trends that are happening right now. And I'm talking about the 
I'm not, I'm talking about the middle class customer, um, the younger middle class demographic. I'm not talking about what's happening with the poor or what's happening with the super rich, but I'm talking about the middle class. Um, one is that the customer is evolving much faster than I, than we gave them credit for. Um, they are evolving in sophistication very quickly. Uh, so, for example, there was a big European brand that came to India and they were like, oh, you know, the Indian customer is going to be so amazed. It's the first time they can get our product in India and, and you know, it's going to be great. And like we're doing a favor almost. And yes, for a little while, they were the flavor of the month. But a lot of customers, I noticed they moved on and their stores are empty. And, and, um, and they themselves, I mean, I met some of the people, they're shocked themselves at what's happened. I mean, uh, where's a customer... The, the customers just evolved. So then what they did was they did what a lot of brands do, which I think is a huge mistake, is started discounting deeper and deeper. And yes, you get you get a different demographic coming to you. You don't get the aspirational demographic. You get the demographic that just wants to buy something at you know, 320 rupees for a dress. So uh, the second thing that's happened, which caught me in a way uh, completely, uh, I, I thought it was going to happen, but... It, it happened in it happened in twelve months. Is the wellness revolution? This country is going through a huge wellness revolution, and you know, I, I um, it's it's like people are uh, talking about wellness. They want to have healthy lifestyles. They're looking for wellness choices in a way that didn't. I mean, it, it was a mega trend that appeared almost in twelve months, and I think COVID. I think the pandemic has really accelerated that. And, and it's one where we're well positioned because we have a lot of wellness products. We are, in fact, we were caught about two years ago, we made a decision to move entirely out of chemicals in our personal care range. But we thought, okay, we'll do it over time. We have so much inventory in the system. We were moving at an elephant space. The revolution came like this and we are behind the curve. So now we're scrambling to catch up and we're bringing in the you know range, which will take you know, it, there's a time lag, so it'll take another six to nine months to come in. But the wellness revolution has been huge. And you can see it in a lot of wellness brands. And, and the third thing is the, the consumers are now also looking at environmental footprint. In a way, the youngsters that it's just, again, I mean, I was walking uh, with a plastic bag and uh, a mother was walking with her two kids who must have been, and uh, they pointed to the plastic bag and, and uh, they made a comment about it. And I thought, wow, there's obviously been a lot of sensitization in schools against plastics, against single use plastics. And when you see that really, you see that change really coming. And so I think these are good changes. I think that as businesses, we have to kind of evolve to catch up with the customer. Um, I think, a brand that is trendy today can be dead tomorrow. So Absolutely. it's, it's uh, my caution for people about being too trendy is that if you're too trendy today, you might not be trendy tomorrow, in which case, you know. So, uh, you know, one thing that you always say is um, you've always wanted Fab India to be synonymous with trust, right? Uh, and trust is one of those intangible things that can't always be quantified. You can't put a metric on trust. Um, how have you quantified trust or even qualified trust for Fab India as a brand? Um, uh, and, and again, I see this across the board, right? Because today there's, there's a new direct-to-consumer brand coming up on a daily basis. Um, uh, but there's a big difference in between going to market uh, and then signaling trust to customers. So uh, how do you build trust and how do you measure trust at scale? Well, trust is a hard thing because... It can take you know a century to build and a week to destroy. So all a company has to do is do one thing wrong. And during the course of a company's life, you're not going to get everything right. I mean, you know, you're taking thousands of decisions. But trust is a really important uh, connection. Um, and and I think that uh, one of the ways in which you um, build trust is by being a fair by being a fair dealer. Uh, and by being a fair deal, it means you always take the long view of a relationship. So if if you have a, an interaction with a company as, as a customer and you feel that you've been wronged in some way, 
You know, you need, the company needs to see the lifetime value of a relationship and often sacrifice the short term. And often our tendency is to say, no, you made the mistake and therefore this problem happened rather than saying, look, I understand it from your perspective. You know, obviously there are times that customers really do do something completely wrong, in which case you call them on it. But but most of the time you are in favor of the customer. That's a simple relationship. But in the relationships with your vendors, in the relationships with your employees, you know, you deliver what you promise on. You know, a lot of people, you know, when it comes to things like ESOPs, I've seen so many companies, they've, they've actually not been true to what they promised their people. And they've, they've put in clauses, you know, you can always slide in a clause today that you as an employee might miss, but it's not going to make you feel good about the company. I can say, well, look, point number, you know, Article 17 says here that in this situation. So, you know, if you do something like that, and a lot of companies do this all the time, you might be right technically, legally, but the person's going to feel terrible. They're going to feel like, wow, I, I trusted this company. And then they, you know, <laughs> they said in this condition, if that happens, then they will do this. I mean, really it's, and, you know, once that relationship sours, um, it spreads across the organization people talk about it. And, um, and I think one of the, the things that we've been able to do, especially with the people who've been former employees, current employees, you know, is that we've created an ethos of trust that yes, we will make mistakes, but it will never be done with the intention to be too smart. I mean, that's, I think, the basis for trust. And as an organization, right, how do you, how do you quantify trust? So, uh, so when one says Fab India is a brand that consumers trust, right? Um, uh, you as the chairman of Fab India, what are the, are there metrics that you look at to reiterate whether this customer actually continues to give their trust to you or not? Um, that's a very hard one because there's really no KPI. There's no direct KPI for trust. Um, there is a tangential one for trust, which is, you know, the growth of the brand and the business and, and the feeling. You see it often in, in dealings with, say, landlords. Uh, they pick your brand at a lower rent over other brands that are offering a higher rent. Why? Because they know you're considered to be a fair, fair player. So you see it in these tangential ways and in all these relationships. In, in suppliers who say, okay, I know you're in a tight position right now with cash. I know you will always pay your bill. That's a statement of trust. That is someone saying, I trust you. Even though I'm in a vulnerable position, I trust you will make good to me. It, it happens when a landlord gives their property um, at, you know, gives you a thir two thirds of the market rent when people are offering them the full market rent because they trust that you will be fair with them. Um, it happens in many such situations. So you have to watch for those situations and, um, and, and they, are, they are actually signaling points on what the market perception of an organization is. I want to segue into a whole other conversation now, which is uh, your opinion of where the future of retail is going, right? Uh, you guys, uh, you, when, you, when you were talking about your long-term bets in terms of building community uh, and also in terms of rethinking your stores and becoming more lifestyle experiences, uh, we've seen a seismic shift in terms of, uh, you know, just offline retail and even and even e-commerce for that matter, thanks to COVID. Um, and there have obviously been some permanent, you know, changes that have happened uh, because of COVID, one big one being uh, at least one data point that we see on LBB is that that whole experience of window shopping is now happening online uh, instead of it happening offline, right? Um, so that that's one. But what are the other, you know, permanent changes or permanent impacts of COVID, both on the customer as well as retailer front that you see sort of, you know, continuing even in a post-COVID era? So you can divide that into sort of into... Uh, two parts. One is the channel strategy and, and the other is the product. So let me start with the product. I think that it's clear that there are going to be three product streams that emerge. Um, uh, products built around value, like really inexpensive products that people, the mass will buy. Um, and that's really the Primark model. Um, you know, I once had to go into Primark and fit a suitcase and I could fill it, you know, for... 150 or 200 pounds, you know, there was so much, it was so cheap. So that model is going to really take off, I feel, in the future because there are a lot of people who just, you know, who are on a budget 
The second trend that is interesting is the trend for luxury, super luxury. And I think that, you know, um, you people are going to uh, want to continue to have luxury because it, it is about making them feel really good about themselves or it is about making someone else feel really good by gifting them something luxurious. Um, you know, and um, I think there that is something that's there to stay. And I think the third area, which is new, is ideology, is retail is an ideology. Now, what is going out is all your premium, sub-premium, path to premium brands, like brands like The Gap and, you know, all, banana, all these brands that were kind of in the middle, they're going to disappear, in my opinion. And so there will be three product streams emerging, you know, products that are really cheap, luxury, and then ideology. And when I say ideology, it's products uh, and companies that represent a higher purpose. So I think these three streams are going to be you know, very strong. I see uh, platforms like Etsy. If you look at Etsy in the US, it has been the best performer on the Standard & Poor's Index during the COVID. People have really moved to the craft craft because it's an ideology. It's selling, it's selling products with a purpose uh, and an ideology. Similarly, you know, the discounting, uh, the, the incredibly great offers Walmart has. Walmart's had 79% growth on their web platform. Uh, they are now only second to Amazon and they're catching up with Amazon as an e-commerce retailer. And they're offering an incredible value for money proposition which customers are flocking to. Um, I think in terms of channel strategies, that any company that doesn't have a good e-commerce strategy is finished. So in terms of channel strategies, you have to. E-commerce is going to become very big. I think that we're going to see different models of retail emerging, like um, what I would call white glove service in retail, retail which is at your door, retail where you can you know, shop on, you can do uh, um, what's called omni-channel, where you partially shop online, partially shop in a place. You, you'll have more showrooming, where you go into a showroom, you see something, and then you... So many models like that will evolve. So on term, in terms of the channel strategy. So these new channels or these channels that were tiny earlier are going to grow rapidly. I think the idea of having a physical retail space will only be attractive if it is part of a, a broader experience and a lifestyle. So I want to meet you. We meet in a cafe. We look at some product. You try it on. You say it looks nice, but I want to have this taken in a bit and altered. It gets altered. You have your coffee. I think the idea of just going to a rectangular box with stuff you know, hanging on a shelf is going to die. Could you give um, examples of companies that you've seen do a really good job of this? Um, what's that? Uh, Lululemon has done a fantastic job with the experience centers. Starbucks has been an amazing job with the experience center cafes. Um, other brands that have done a, a, a tremendous uh, job with experiences, gosh, uh, the retailer John Lewis in the UK has done a wonderful job because they have such good quality foods, clothing, you know, and it's built around an ideology and a purpose. So, yeah, in India, there are not so many. I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, it's still a market that it needs to be explored, but there aren't so many right now. What do you think holds Indian retailers back so much? Because I don't think there's a dearth of, you know, counter examples or counterparts in the US or the UK, right? Uh, is it just that this customer's, you know, purchasing power or, or ability to spend isn't growing uh, or that the absolute number of customers who can actually buy, you know, a mass stage or semi-premium products is not growing? What is holding Indian retailers back? It, it's hard to innovate when... Uh, your whole ecosystem is very conventional. So your funders are conventional. Your The people who are coming to you from industry have a conventional mindset. So when everybody around you has a conventional mindset, it's very hard to innovate. Uh, and I, I think it's, it's, about, it's true for any field. See, when you hire someone who comes from a conventional mindset and they're used to doing something and they've done it in their last three jobs, they're not going to say, oh, I'm going to come into this job and do something totally different. They're going to say, I bring the experience, this vast experience, and I have to be senior vice president because I bring you know, 25 years of vast experience. So I'm not going to change the way I do things. And then you have funders who are also saying, okay, let's look at your traditional KPIs and, and look at that and, and 
judge you by by those KPIs. So I think that way the environment is is very um, it's hard. The U.S. has one advantage, which is that they allow founders to create different voting rights and shares. So you can have really zany founders with what seems to be wacko ideas, but the market allows them to control the companies through the differential voting rights. So, and, and um, we have been slow to adopt differential voting rights. Every country is going to have to adopt it. The countries that adopt it first are going to have a huge advantage. The ones, the late adopters are going to have. Um, and it's sad because today, if you look at, say, Sachin and Vinnie Bunsen, I would say they were as good as Jeff Bezos, if not better. Jeff Bezos had one advantage that they didn't have. He could keep producing equity, class B shares, class C shares, class D shares. So he had limited access to unlimited sums of capital. In their case, every time they diluted, they lost control of Flipkart. So I'm using them as an example because they've, they've, everybody knows them, but there are thousands of such amazing entrepreneurs who lose control and their, their, their businesses become in a way more conventional or whatever, but, but it wouldn't happen if, if entrepreneurs had the access. But, um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a big change in, in policy. And hopefully, you know, over time it'll come. Uh, but if it came, I'm sure, because I, I, I'm a great believer, I think India has the best entrepreneurs in the world. I mean, the absolute best. If that change came, nothing could hold India back because its entrepreneurs would, because we, right now uh, the world is a wash in capital. The only thing is that with differential voting rights, you're saying that an entrepreneur can get their vision, however, you know, odd the vision might seem. And that's where innovation takes place with those odd visions. Because of every 10 odd balls, two guys create history. It, end up, you know, blowing up the capital. But the system is set up for that. They, they recognize that, you know, I mean, it's, it's an interesting. Yeah. Uh, so you're an angel investor also, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and an entrepreneur as well. Um, just, you know, uh, closing couple of questions. Uh, what is the, what is the piece of advice that you, that you give to entrepreneurs starting out today? You know, what are the opportunities that you want to see entrepreneurs double down on? Um, and, and also what are the, what are the mental frameworks or the mental models that you want to see entrepreneurs adapt to build their brands better? I was an angel investor. I stopped. And I stopped for the simple reason that uh, it, it was a very uh, painful process to see so many businesses fail. Um, and my advice to entrepreneurs is don't get out of business school and start a business. Work, do something really, really difficult. Work in a difficult area um, and cut your teeth and understand the value of work. And because it's very easy so just had to sit in business school and create all these pitch decks with these options. And, uh, you know, and people get seduced by uh, all these things. Oh, I'll, I'll do a, a convertible and I'll do it like this. And I have a put and call option. And, and everybody gets like, wow, this is like such fun. We can keep raising money and having rounds. And it's like, a, you know, it's, it's a substitute for hard work. And I know I sound really boring. But almost every one of those entrepreneurs who came out of business school and set up uh, a business has failed for the reason that they just didn't have the humility that comes with. They were smart. They were super smart because they got into great business schools and they're really hard. They're, they're, they're far brainier than, than me or most people I know. But there's something that comes from just doing the grind that in and working your way up and then becoming an entrepreneur. That last, be no, totally fair. Last two questions for you. The first one is, uh, what are the Indian brands that are in your little black book uh, and Indian brands that you've tried and you, you know, hands down recommend to everyone? Gosh, there's so many great brands. Um, I think a brand that's phenomenally innovative and, and great fun is Nicobar. I think they've done a fantastic job. Um, I think, gosh, uh, 
a brand said, okay, I think a brand that I've always had huge respect for because they never delivered a pizza late in, and I've ordered thousands of pizzas at Domino's. I don't know how they do it. They have never, ever rain, shine, you know, traffic jam, never deliver a pizza late. Oh, a brand that's great is Lenskart. Lenskart is a fantastic brand. You call them, they arrive, you get your glasses, they wear their PPE suits, and, you know, it's their on time, another great there's so many innovative uh, brands that um, you know, one has. Lenskart is a, is a great example and actually a, a great example of people who identified their job to be done very, very, very well um, and delivered on that job to be done fairly well. Um, last question for you, uh, a book or books podcast that you recommend every brand builder or entrepreneur reads? Mm, there's a book about execution by Larry Bossetti and Ram Charan which is a fantastic book. There's a book by Reed, uh, the guy who created Netflix. It's called No Rules Rule, uh, Reed Hastings. So Reed Hastings wrote a fantastic book about No Rules Rule. Um, the execution book is really about the nuts and bolts of execution. Um, uh, the, another book that uh, is about exponential growth, how to achieve exponential growth using the technologies of today. And it's, it's by Salim Ismail, I think. Uh, it's, uh, I think I've got the title right. So these are books recently and Loon Shots by Safi Bakal is another fantastic book that I've read recently. These are great books. I have made a note of all of them. Thank you so much. I have honestly learned more in the past uh, like 45 minutes than I have in like one year of reading a lot. Um, thanks to COVID, I think I've just immersed myself in, uh, in, in as much literature as I possibly can. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, always a pleasure chatting with you. Um, and, and I couldn't, you know, uh, echo more um, of everything that you said about the disruption that's not only happening in retail, but e-commerce as well, right? Where now direct-to-consumer has become such an interesting way to not just build trust, but also build brands. Uh, and of course, platforms like YouTube, Instagram, etc. are only creating more and more avenues of the same. So thank you so much for doing this. Oh, you're very welcome. It's always a pleasure.